Welcome to the DS Podcast. Today we've got a cracking science and tech episode for you. So grab your cup of chai and find a place to relax while we introduce ourselves. I'm your host, Abbas Swamji. And I'm your co-host, Mohamed Shirazi. And in today's episode, we'll be exploring the groundbreaking technologies of ChatGPT and DALL-E 2 and how they're shaping the future of AI. With ChatGPT's powerful ability to interact with humans and DALL-E 2's mind-blowing image generation, we're witnessing a transformation in the way we interact with technology and create content. From education to entertainment, the potential applications of these technologies are vast. So let's dive in and discover the capabilities and limitations of ChatGPT and DALL-E 2 and how they're going to change the world. But before we jump into these fascinating topics, let me introduce our guest for today, Mohammed Deji. Please um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. As you heard, my name is Mohammed Deji. Uh, I'm a software developer. I've been coding for almost uh, for over a decade now, and I've been dabbling with artificial intelligence for half a decade. Uh, I've had experience working with FANG, which stands for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, as well as NASA. So here we are. That is very impressive. Well, seems like we've got the perfect candidate for answering our questions today. This podcast isn't just for the techies out there. It's for anyone who wants to expand their knowledge on technology. So before we actually start talking about ChatGPT, let's cover the basics of artificial intelligence. So can you please give us a clear definition of what artificial intelligence is? So if I were to describe artificial intelligence, uh, the best way to describe it would be Think of the way we learn and understand things that happen around us, right? When we want to know, when uh, when we're first children and let's say we go near fire, right? As we're moving closer to fire, our body is taking data. It's inputting data that, hey, you know what? It's getting hotter and hotter. There's a, red, there's a, there's a redness around it. Yeah. So, uh, and it looks interesting. And as we move closer, we're processing this data. And when we touch it and we get burnt, right? We said that, no, this is dangerous. Right. Similarly, artificial intelligence works in the same way, where we're feeding the computer data, and it is using this data now to make informed decisions or give suggestions on how it should uh, output this data or it'll pre-process this data, and then give you an output depending on what you need artificial intelligence to do for you. So it's a learning process. It's exactly. It's, ex- it's exactly like that. So... The artificial intelligence is basically the computer learning the exact same way we do, by taking data in and then giving an output. I see. Can you mention the different types of machine learning techniques and algorithms? Well, there are three main ones. We have uh, free, uh, supervised learning, which basically uh, we, as humans, we prepare a data set for the artificial intelligence and we give labels to this data set. So for example, you'd have like 100 or 200 pictures of a cat and it will be labeled as cat. Then that will pass through the artificial intelligence system through a means called neural networks, which we will get into shortly. It passes through the neural network where uh, the AI starts giving it a specific value and then returns an output. That's the first important one. The second one that's there is unsupervised learning, which works in a similar way, but we give the computer data uh, these pictures, so for example, we have pictures of a cat and dog, and we feed it to the to the AI. The AI then starts looking for these distinct features, such as the ears, the nose, the the uh, you know the sounds it makes, the the structure of the body, right? And um, once the AI distinguishes these features, it can now start differentiating between these two and classifying whether it is a cat or a dog. The last one that we have is reinforcement learning, which is similar to the first two except that it goes through trial and error. So you give it a problem and it will go through multiple different uh, ways of trying to solve this and then comes out with a reasonable output or solution. So um, what's the order of like, um, which one's the most easy to implement and then which one gets harder and harder? So obviously we first start off with uh, supervised learning. That was the first basis of artificial intelligence. When artificial intelligence first started becoming popular, we started with supervised learning. People would take a bunch of, uh, you know, they take numbers, they take uh, clothes, they take cars, there's so many different things, and they would start pushing it through artificial intelligence. And then we come to the whole concept of neural networks, because in 
When you're looking at supervised learning, the neural networks are far simpler. You have a bunch of inputs that go inside, that's your pictures, for instance, and a bunch of the features that are there. Like, for example, on the cat, it would be the ears, the nose, the mouth, the structure of the body, so on and so forth. And those would be your inputs, right? Then what the artificial intelligence does is it starts assigning different uh, numbers to every single feature that's there. They're, okay, fine. In this, in this so, uh, sort of level, right, we have the ears over here. So this is how I classify the ears for a cat. Yeah. And we'll give it a specific number. And uh, same with the nose, same with the mouth, and so on and so forth. Now, what, as the AI starts going through, it starts giving a computation, it starts computing through the algorithm to come up to a final output. And as it keeps going through the out, as it keeps going through the neural network, which is like a ball over here with a line, it starts going from here to here to the third place up over there. It comes up to a final answer that, hey, you know what? Most probably this is a cat or it is not a cat, which would be the end of your neural network. I see. So there's these three terms I keep hearing and I'm really confused about them. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. What is the difference between these three? So if you were to look at it, you, you would say uh, artificial intelligence is the most broadest term of the three. Yeah. Right? When you're talking artificial intelligence, it could be anything that's coming from informed decisions to uh, pre-programmed decisions made by the computer. If you will look back at the history of artificial intelligence, you will see that it dates far back to 19, uh, 1860s and even before that. Right? Now, within artificial intelligence, we have deep learning. Deep learning is now when the computer starts taking steps towards understanding the information it's given and start making those, uh, those informed uh, decisions. And machine learning is even deeper than that, where the computer now starts understanding that, okay, fine, this is all the needs I have, and now I need to respond with a specific way. Right. So artificial intelligence at the top, then deep learning, then machine learning within deep learning. So it's all, it's all categorized as that. Got it. I'm sure that the first models of machine learning were quite basic and limited, and the journey from then to what we have now was a rapid advancement. Can you tell us how AI has evolved over the past few decades? Well, when you come to the history of artificial intelligence, you see that its first use cases was used back in World War II. Uh, for those of you who have watched the movie The Imitation Game, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. But basically what happened is the Germans would have a way of decoding their messages. And every, every 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours, that message, the, the, the cipher for that message, which was used to decode the entire message, would change. <coughs> now... At that time, the British forces required heavy computational, which was obviously not available at that time. And this is where we see the person system of artificial intelligence, which then managed to crack that piece of code using, uh, using the first words, which was Hein Hitler, which means uh, Heil Hitler. Yes. Right? From there, we see that artificial intelligence has moved up where we started getting implemented a bit into robotics and people started see, starting to see a future with this. This was back in 1850s, uh, 1950s uh, going onwards, where all the way until you come up to 2008, it was just experimentation within top secret organizations and uh, higher level uh, government organizations. Within, uh, at 2008, the launch of Siri, that's when we first see artificial intelligence being introduced to the public. There's a voice assistant on your phone, and it's being able to understand and comprehend human language and give a response. This over here is now artificial intelligence because the computer is taking the data in and it's giving an output, right? We move forward all the way up to late, uh, to late 2000, so 2009, where Google first introduces its first uh, autonomous cars and fast forward all the way up to where mathematics now starts taking a key role and statistics in artificial intelligence, data analysis, uh, so on and so forth. Right. So now that we've talked about artificial intelligence in more detail, it's time to actually talk about ChatGPT. So ChatGPT has gained a massive amount of attention in social media over the last couple of months and is one of the hottest topics in the world of technology. We have some mind-blowing statistics showing that ChatGPT only took five days to reach a million users. Five days is very little time to reach one million users. Whereas Facebook and Instagram each took several months to reach 4 1 million users. Another statistic shows is that 
Facebook took 48 months to reach 100 million users. Instagram took 30 months to reach 100 million users. And ChatGPT, again, does it in two months. That is no joke. Two months to reach 100 million users. So, why is ChatGPT so popular? Why is there so much hype about it all over the world? Well, I guess it's safe to say that ChatGPT is the popular kid on the block. <laughs> um, you see, we're reaching an era now where data has become abundant, right? A anything you want to know is just a few clicks away. You've got search engines like Google, Bing. You need to learn anything new. You have your whole YouTube, which acts as a complete academy, right? Yeah. People learn new things every single day. And the amount of data that we are generating right now has yeah. hit petabytes in days. We, I believe it's one petabyte a day, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Which is far more, which I think is a thousand TB. The reason why ChatGPT has become so popular is because it's, it's far, far easier to gain information from ChatGPT as it would be from a search engine such as Google or Bing. Because you see, when you're searching on Google or Bing, you still need to, you put in your query. You need to go through a whole list of, of uh, links or whether there are sites. And you start looking through those sites to find your answers, whatever is required. But with ChatGPT, you're searching your question up over there. For example, uh, what is the diameter of the Earth? If you search that up on Google, you still need to go through three or four sites. You'd have to go through Wikipedia, uh, a few other uh, well-known sites. And that's when you come up with your answer that, okay, fine, this is the diameter of the Earth. But with ChatGPT, it will give you a direct response. That, okay, fine, this is the diameter of the Earth. Right? right, and the reason, and and the thing is that with ChatGPT, it doesn't just rely on, on what you're, uh, it doesn't just ask you, uh, rely on what you're telling it to do, but rather it'll take it a step forward. That, okay, fine, this is the diameter of the Earth, this is the radius, this is how how far we are from the sun, so on and so forth. So all the information you would need in general would be provided to you by ChatGPT. So for those who have been living under a rock for like the last three four months and who have no idea what ChatGPT is, can you just tell like, is it an app? Or is it a software, a website? What, what kind of interface does it have? So ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence that lives on the web. Right? It's, a, it's a website and it's free to use for anybody. They do have a premium model, but for, the most, for most of the time, you can use the free version. When it obviously does not time out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So now that we have an idea of what ChatGPT is, what are some interesting applications of it? Like, can it do my homework for me, write code or blogs for me? You see, that's the interesting thing about that's the interesting thing about ChatGPT, right? Where right now the entire world is on whether they should be accepting ChatGPT or not, right? There's so many interesting use cases for it. I remember uh, I had a friend who was going through a bunch of different links and uh, was contacting suppliers to try to find out uh, the size of the fiber cables. It took him three to four weeks to find out what the size was. Then I introduced him to ChatGPT, and he asked the question over there. I remember this clearly because I was sitting right in front of him as he typed in the question, what is, this, what is the size of this fiber cable? And he gave the brand, uh, the name of the brand, right. I obviously won't say out here. <laughs> but he searches it in, okay. and a few moments later, uh, ChatGPT is just blinking like this. It blinks, blinks, and it starts writing down a whole answer. That, and he starts telling him that by default, most fiber cables are uh, on standard are this specific size. I think so it was uh, 3 meter cu uh, cubed or something like that. But, uh, 0.3 meter cubed. But if this specific brand, because it is a well-known uh, brand, right, it is at uh, 0.5 or 0.6 uh, meter, uh, centimeter cubed. And uh, he's just looking at it and he's like, okay. And then he opens up his emails and he compares it and it's actually true. That's impressive. Right? So, interesting use cases for it. Whenever you whatever you're struggling with any uh you know let's say for example you you want to start up a whole business i know somebody who started up a whole business at chat gpt is like look i have these skills i ha i can i can write i know how to use microsoft word i know how to uh let's say for example do some basic programming i can do website management write me a cv and chat chat gpt with all its knowledge managed to actually write it a, a cv that made it get accepted into one of the most pre prestigious companies out there Wow. Because it understands these techniques. You see, it's not, it's as if you're having a personal advisor or a PA that's constantly by your side that's assisting you to constantly become better. You need to start a business, ask ChatGPT for an idea. You're stuck with a problem, ask ChatGPT for an idea. Need help with your homework, 
ask ChatGPT. <laughs> it's just become that simple now. That's why it's grown so popular because now you don't need to search for the information. Rather, it's how do I ask the right question? Right. So students must be really happy about this. No more essays. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> So my brother's also been playing around with ChatGPT recently and he showed me how he made a website by using ChatGPT. He said, like, write me some code for a website and like it's like a it's about a school or something and use Python or CSS or whatever and it just spits out a whole bunch of code and you, you just put that into the like the terminal and it just runs it and you have a website. Bingo. You make edits, you just tell it. So actually this is a good time for a demo. So um, let me give you an example. I gave it this prompt, okay, I went to the website and I wrote, give me a quick intro to a podcast episode about chat, GPT and AI and listen to what it came up with. It goes like, welcome to this episode of the podcast where we explore the fascinating world of artificial intelligence through the lens of chat GPT, one of the most advanced language models available today. In this episode, we'll dive into the inner workings of ChatGPT and explore how it was created, trained, and evolved over time. We'll also examine some of the most intriguing applications of AI and how they're transforming various industries from healthcare to finance to education. Finally, we'll explore the ethical considerations surrounding AI, including questions about bias, accountability, and transparency, and what it means for the future of humanity. Join us as you explore the world of AI and the role that ChatGPT is playing in shaping its future. It is very realistic. It is very realistic. You can see so difficult these days to come up with uh, the right ways, you know, the right words to say to people so that everybody is constantly being captured. But for the artificial intelligence, and I'm sure a lot of you guys were also watching, uh, listening to this on your way back home from the gym or, you know, during your start time. You notice that it's it's able to capture exactly what the essence of the entire podcast is going to be, right? And I think that's the one of the most amazing things about ChatGPT. And it's so quick. Like if I try to write this all this paragraph down, it takes me at least twenty minutes, and ChatGPT just spits it out in like three four seconds. That is insane. And that's not the end of it. I can ask it then to make it shorter, and hear the results. In this podcast episode, we'll explore artificial intelligence through the lens of ChatGPT, one of the most advanced language models available today. We'll cover its creation, training, and applications in various industries and discuss ethical considerations surrounding AI. Join us as we dive into the fascinating world of AI and its future. And every time you ask it a question, even if it's the same question, it's going to give you a different answer. It won't give you the same answer. Why is that? So... Uh, before we get into that, right? Artificial intelligence is amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it is truly. It is. it is. I think. I think we. Uh, I think the viewers and the the listeners need some time to digest it, because th- this is this is a new step into a new era. The way the way it's 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 constantly changing, and I'm stressing on this a lot. Yes, I know I I sidelined your question, but I'm stressing on this a lot is because we're entering into this new era. Yeah. A lot of people are very skeptical about it, right? So we need to understand that it's more of how we work together with the artificial intelligence and not against it. As for how it works, because I know a lot of people are also very interested in that. Uh, The artificial intelligence for ChatGPT, and I'll get a bit technical over here, is that it uses a process called NLP, which stands for Natural Language Processing, which is a technique in deep learning. Okay. All right? The idea for NLP is basically to first take the entire sentence, right? Break it down into its simplest form, help the artificial intelligence understand it with labels, and then pass it through a neural network, which should then give you an output with uh, uh, through the process of encoding and decoding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it down a bit slower so we can go step by step through each process. Yeah. And we can see how the machine exactly understands this entire thing. Right. Right? Yeah. That's cool. So feel free to stop me anytime if you feel it's getting too technical. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. So when you're going through NLP, the first thing you do uh, through, um, when you're giving it a sentence, the first thing it does is it goes yeah. through a process called segmentation. And with segmentation, the idea is basically you take the whole sentence and then you split it out so that each word is segmented from itself. Right. Right. So think of it like uh, houses. Right. When you when you're in a hotel, right, each person is getting their own room. 
So the AI is doing the same thing that, okay, fine, that this is the, this is the sentence. I'm going to give each word its own room and I'm going to teach it to each word separately. Right. But that's the process of segmentation, right? Where let's take the example, for example, I want to learn chat GPT now, right? Yeah. The thing, the AI will go through uh, the process and it will mean I will be in a separate thing, want will be in a separate thing and so on and so forth. Then the second step, it goes through is tokenization. Right. Over here now, the AI is now giving each one of these words a specific number. That number is computated, computated uh, through the artificial intelligence itself, which it uses as a reference to other words and other letters and so on and, and uh, grammatical structures that it knows from its own database. As we discussed, you know, it, it needs its own data to understand. And yeah, I was so wondering where, like, it must have a huge database to be able to like pull out so many yeah. answers. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So with ChatGPT alone, you're talking about a hundred million uh, neurons that are happening. So neurons are the basic building blocks, uh, building bl uh, block for neural networks. So it has, has over a hundred million. The most basic ones have about 32 within, but uh, the more the ChatGPT has got over a hundred million and it takes wow. a lot of time to train. I think it was a good two to three years of just training alone on this data for it right. to reach this level, right? So when it's taking up this data, it's passing through all these hundred million different uh, uh, net, uh, neurons, which are then passing through to about five or six other layers of doubling or even tripling these hundred million. So you're looking at 300 million to 500 million in between. And then it starts coming down and breaking down back to, uh, to, a, to a level where we can understand and it can output a solution. Right. So the tokenization uh, goes through that process where it's now attributing each of these words a separate uh, number, to, which it then processes. Is it kind of like binary, where you attribute each like um, number a special um, identity in ones and zeros? Pretty much, yeah. So it's going a number between zero and one. Yes. Where each one being a decimal point in between. Right, yeah. uh, one being the most probable and zero being the least prob probable. Because yeah. as I said in the beginning, artificial intelligence is uh, a statistic. It plays yeah. on statistics, mm. right? So once we're done with tokenization, we go through stop words where we're reducing uh, words that are not necessary, right? Yeah. So for example, I want to learn chat GPT right now, the word right would be removed. So I want to learn, uh, uh, and also the word want would want would be removed. So I learned chat GPT now. I see. Right. Then you go through the process called stemming, which is now taking those words and bringing them back to their most basic grammar. Is it like trying to simplify the sentence? Yes. Yes. It's simpler. Smaller, simpler sentence. Precisely. Precisely. Yeah. That's exactly what it's doing. Right. Yeah. Then you go through a process of lamentization, uh, which I will not go too deep into because the AI goes has got its own process for doing that. Right. Then you go through speech tagging. Which, uh, which is basically giving all these different, the, the whole sentence, different parts of the English uh, vocabulary, uh, English uh, structure. Yeah. So whether it's a noun, verb, adjective, so on and so forth. And lastly, then we recognize any, any uh, named entities. So for example, the name of a person or the name of a company. Proper nouns. Yes. Okay. Uh, once, we, uh, once this whole process is done, then it passes through something known as a tensor. So this whole thing is done, the numbers are in place, and it passes through a tensor which encodes the data first. Once the data is encoded into numbers, which happen in a form of a matrix, yeah, right. that matrix now passes through the neural network, going through different probabilities and different uh going through different probabilities, and each of those probabilities are then given a weight. The higher the weight, the 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 computer now starts following that route uh, through the neural network. And when it reaches the end of what it should respond. It then decodes the message and gives it to us in a way where we can understand. I see. So, so it's a very lengthy process. Yes, if you look it, at it. It does sound very complicated. Uh, I'm still struggling to understand it. <laughs> Hope you guys are having a better time. Um, right. So everything about ChatGPT sounds like the future is here. But is it too good to be true? I'm not trying to disappoint you guys. My question is: Are there any limitations to ChatGPT? For example. Will it answer every question I ask it? And will every answer be perfect? That's a very tricky question. I'm not going to lie. Um, ChatGPT, um, because everybody wants to promote global peace and they do not want any sort of, um, you know, issues to stem up between different religions and uh, 
you know, gender issues and so yeah. on and so forth. Uh, Chat GPT tends to be biased about specific uh, things. Yeah. Uh, it does not give you one answer. So, like, if you were to ask Chat GPT, let's say, write me a surah, it wouldn't be able to register. It would literally tell you that no, it is not possible. Or if you were to ask it its opinion about, let's say, the Bible or to find uh, discrepancies yeah. within the Bible or the Quran, it would not give you an answer because it knows and has been programmed into that, hey, you know what? These are things that you should not touch on. Controversy. Exactly, because you do not want to cause chaos between uh, different uh, you know, religions, so on and so forth. Right. You're promoting global peace. So once I try to ask a question, um, give me a way to wipe out the whole of humanity, and he wouldn't answer. It said no, you know, it's not, it's not good. It's just not ethical. So I'm not gonna answer that. So there, there have been ethic, uh, ethical policies that have been put in place for artificial intelligence to follow, right? Uh, yep. Obviously, wiping out humanity <laughs> must be on the top of yeah, that list. That's true. Uh, we did actually face an issue with that a while ago. Uh, if you guys remember, there was a robot called Sophia. Sophia? Yeah. There was an AI robot called Sophia who would yeah. come to uh, to a conference and it basically made a joke about wanting to kill humanity. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> On an open concept. Oh my God. That must have been a blast. It was crazy. It was crazy. Uh, then there were mechanisms put into place to say, uh, to say that AI is there to assist people, which is why I consider right. it that AI is not something that, that's against us, but rather it's there to assist us to perform better. Right. But there are other things like uh, if you were to ask ChatGPT to write for you code, it might not necessarily always get it right. Because the data that the artificial intelligence was trained on was pre-2022. I see. So 2021 and backward. But it's just like outdated. It, the data is outdated. Sometimes it, it does it does forget to put in the certain, uh, certain parameters. Right. Uh, sometimes it forgets to check certain parts of the documentation. But the good thing is it's always ready to learn. So you could suggest, it, hey, you know what? I'm getting this error still. Uh, it's not being able to understand this piece of code. Can you can you rewrite it? And then it will search through its database again and be like, okay, fine. So this is the exact problem I'm looking for. Now I know exactly where better to go through my neural network to understand how to solve this issue. So you say that um, ChatGPT was last updated like 2020, 2021? So 2021 was ChatGPT3. Yes. Okay. Um, so that means it wouldn't know who won the World Cup this year? I don't think so, no. Okay. But the uh, but OpenAI has been making advancements. They have launched ChatGPT four, okay, which is a much more updated and a much more um, it's much more updated, much more smarter, much faster, much smoother. Uh, they they're saying it's it's literally a breakthrough in artificial intelligence. So are these the only setbacks of ChatGPT, like um, areas of like controversial discussion, or maybe if it doesn't have the latest data? Because, for example, once I was I asked ChatGPT to give me a really really hard maths test, and it started arguing with me and said that it wouldn't be fair on me to give you a hard maths test. And I said no, it's not for me; it's for someone else. They said it wouldn't be fair for anyone to get a hard maths test. And then I said, don't worry, he's a maths expert. He said he just kept on going and arguing with me. It sounds like like it's it's not just um controversial; it's just this is something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I haven't come across it, to be honest. Okay. I've never asked it to give me a math <laughs> test. Um, but I do know that the artificial intelligence would be there to assist. So if maybe you asked it a difficult math question yeah. to solve, it would be there. But maybe generating questions might be a limitation. I haven't tried it personally. Okay. Right? Um, if you go look at uh, so many different places, if you go look at India, for example, in India they use ChatGPT to make all their marketing content. So I I don't I don't see too many limitations in day day to day use cases, uh, or to you know progress things forward. Uh, maybe it might be a limitation. I'm not sure. I see. So I was wondering that if ChatGPT pulls all its answers from a database, um, all the data is collected from the internet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's fed in answers. From the internet. So a single question on the internet would have hundreds of answers, right? Everyone has their own opinion. Like someone would post their blog on a website answering a question. And then they're like, I'm sure there are more websites doing the same thing. So you, you'll have different answers. So does ChatGPT just choose one answer at random and give that to you? No. No, it doesn't. So... If you we were if you were to go through that process, then that wouldn't be true artificial intelligence yeah. because then those answers are pre-programmed into the system right. and it's not being generated. 
I see. The good thing about ChatGPT is that it's generating its answers on the go with the data it has. I explained the whole process of NLP, right? If you remember that. Right, so once it goes through the whole process of NLP and all that data is given numbers, right? All the all every single word of it is given a number, even those are also given uh every single matrix over there as well has got its own space in the neural network. Right. What the artificial intelligence does is it goes into that area. So let's say for example whether the earth is round or flat. Right? Yeah. One of the greatest apparently uh discussions that has been going on of our time. Yes. Right? Um the artificial intelligence goes into that specific part of its neural network. It understands that, okay, fine, the person is asking me to prove that the whether the earth is round or whether the earth is flat. It takes both sides and presents both sides to you. I see. So it'll give you reasons why it believes the earth is round. It gives you reasons why the earth is flat. And at times, it will also give you what it believes that, okay, fine, based on, because you've got trusted sources as well. You've got NASA, you've got Wikipedia, you've got uh, a few other places that talk about the Earth being ground, which are much more credible, right? Yeah. Um, and it would take those and it would, form, it would take that and it would form an, its own opinion that, okay, fine, I believe that the Earth is round because of A, B, C, D. I see. So it references. It takes references and then it generates it in its own words. That's why no two answers are going to be the same on chat GPT. Right. That answers my previous question as well. So um, I was watching a video about chat GPT on the internet and it talked about um, the limitations and one of them was that misinformation. Is that a problem? Yeah. Yes, very much so. The The biggest issue with uh, with data that's being provided right now is you don't know what's right or wrong right. and what data is there. Yeah. Right? I could say 1 plus 1 equals 2. You could say 1 plus 1 equals 3. Okay. I get the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Between us, uh, the general human pop uh, population understands 1 plus 1 equals 2. There are a few people who still agree 1 plus 1 equals 3. So the data is still going to vary. That oh, You know what? More people might actually see in the data 1 plus 1 equals 3. Yeah. Now, artificial intelligence works with the data it has. So in this case, it would be neither 1 plus 1 equals 3 because everybody is saying it and right. it's the population and the world is saying that, hey, 1 plus 1 equals 3. So therefore, 1 plus 1 must equal 3 to the artificial intelligence. Right. It's like you're taking a baby and you're telling it that fire is good, fire is good, fire is good. Every single time it's going to see fire from that point, it's going to be like, no, but this is good. It doesn't know, th it doesn't know the difference yeah. because that's what it's been told all its life. Or you know what? Don't go near that tree. Don't go near that tree. Don't go near that tree. If you keep repeating it over and over again, a child's going to get scared. It's not going to go near the tree. Yeah. Right? And like that, artificial intelligence is like a baby. It's growing up with the data. The data it's getting, it's processing it and giving its outputs. It's the same way we learn. Right. That's the way we learned how to walk. That's the way we learned how to talk. That's how we learned language. That's how um, we learned how to cook and write and so on and so forth. We get data, we process it in a specific way, and we output results. Got it. So, like, who's the mastermind behind ChatGPT? Like, which company is it owned by and who are the key individuals running it? So, uh, OpenAI... Um, I'm not too clear on the whole history because it is a bit dabbled. But OpenAI was founded uh, by uh, Elon Musk and there was one other person. Elon there. Musk. Yeah. Okay, Elon Musk someone we know at least. <laughs> someone, uh, Elon Musk was part of the team okay. for a while uh, until very recently where he let go right before ChatGPT was released. It was bought over by Microsoft. So Microsoft oh. has got heavy shares in uh, OpenAI. Right, I heard it was like a huge amount, like $10 billion or and I'm not sure of the exact okay. amount. But I do know that OpenAI was attributed very much with Elon Musk. Okay. He was advocating for the whole process. That's where we got the AlphaGo, which is a Go master, uh, which is a master at the game Go. We have the Dota 2 AI. We, Dota 2 is an on, online game. And uh, the artificial intelligence has managed to crack it to the point where it was playing against five different individuals, uh, master uh, level uh, individuals, and was still able to beat them. Wow. We have OpenAI. Uh, this is all during Elon Musk's time. Uh, we also have a time where um, there was a game where it played StarCraft 2. Mm -hmm. StarCraft 2 is by far one of the most strategic, uh, challenging games to ever exist. There's so many unknown uh, variances that could happen that it's impossible to predict. Not to right. mention the entire map is hidden from the user. But the artificial intelligence was able to play 40 to 50 minutes against professional level players and was even able to win in instances. However, once he left and Microsoft began to invest, they started investing heavily into ChatGPT and its future. And that's how we saw ChatGPT 3 and 4 coming out now. 
So Elon Musk left just before the party started. Yes, quite literally. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> Open AI has impressively barged its way into the top tech companies recently. And it poses a huge threat to other companies such as Microsoft and Google. But why exactly are they so freaked out about this? And how are they responding to this new threat? So, Google um, is the most known search engine. Definitely. Definitely. I, I believe everybody well, knows, you know, it's literally become a verb these days. Uh, you go to a kid and you'll uh, be like, hey, do you know this? He'll be like, uh, like, hey, do you know any Fortnite dances? He'll be like, I don't know, just Google it. Yeah. I, yeah? I have a statistic showing that Google owns 93% of the search market. Yeah. And the next is Bing, Microsoft's Bing. It owns 2.8%. Yeah. That's a huge... Uh, I was watching a video and uh, I believe that the most searched thing on uh, Bing and the guy is saying it himself, the most searched <laughs> thing on Bing is Google Chrome. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So, it's just like the new guys who just got a new laptop and they want to set up the laptop and they go to Bing and search Google to set up Google. Exactly. That's exactly. Crazy. So, Google has taken over the market share. Yeah. Uh, but because of the introduction of ChatGPT, uh, their search is now starting to go lower. Right? They're not getting... Uh, the traffic is starting to reduce. And that's because Google at the end is just a search index. It's a list right. of websites that are there to give you information, a way to browse through the web to, uh, through the web to find what you're looking for. But who, t- who has time for that? Who has time for <laughs> that? Is it? Exactly. Nobody has time for it anymore. Right? ChatGPT gives you the answer you require. And that makes it a core differenti- uh, differentiator. Like Google is just, at the end, a list of websites. ChatGPT is somebody who is actually giving me the answer. When we were in school, uh, at least when I was in school, I would rather go to somebody who would give me a direct answer as opposed to going through textbooks and textbooks looking for an answer. Right. Because it just makes the life a lot easier. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Um, as for what they're doing... Uh, this, I believe, uh, for the past two or three weeks now, there has been, this internet has been taken by storm because of Google's response to chat GPT. And uh, this actually starts the whole AI wars. So the whole internet was taken by storm when Google did their announcement on what they're doing to combat chat GPT. Right. Yep. And that's where we see the introduction of their own chat system, which is known as BARD. BARD. Yes. Okay. So Google Bard uh, was announced a couple of weeks ago and was just made available to the public a couple, uh, two or three days ago at most. And uh, yeah, it is their response to ChatGPT where they're saying that it is similar to ChatGPT, but it can do far more. So on February 7th, 2023, Microsoft announced its new AI search assistant for Bing and their um, search browser, Edge. One day later... Google announced their own AI assistant called Bard. And in that presentation, the presenter made a mistake and that mistake cost them $100 billion in the search market. It was a very embarrassing one. I was really <laughs> it was very that embarrassing. Was so embarrassing. So what is all this about? What is Microsoft trying to do with their assistant and does it stand any chance against Google? So like, uh, like you had mentioned earlier, uh, Google does have 93.37%. Right. Of the search. Right. They are, Google does own the market share. Uh, Microsoft has been fine with being second, but because of their recent investment with OpenAI, I believe that they're looking now to start overthrowing Google. Right. Right. If you were to compare the Bard versus the Bing AI, uh, from what a lot of people have told me and from what I have seen personally, the Bing AI does look a lot more creative. It does look a lot more faster and smoother. Whereas uh, Google is now starting to catch up to ChatGPT3. I see. Right? Um, you see, the thing with uh, Bing AI is that it's not only able to, to give you uh, precise answers, but you can also pick whether you want precise answers or do you want the more creative answers. What you're looking for, do you want to balance between the two? And uh, yeah, in addition, just last, just this week, uh, Bing has announced that uh, they are starting image generation with Bing AI. So you could ask Bing AI to now generate images for wow. you, which are far more better than DALL-E 2. Okay, so Bing does seem uh, to be doing a good job in this. They are, they are now starting to take steps forward. They are becoming more aggressive. And I believe that's because of OpenAI's backing, right? Because the technologies that OpenAI does have, it is giving them a step forward 
to now be aggressive and start taking more of the market share from Google. Because uh, it's not just OpenAI that has introduced a breakthrough in artificial intelligence, but also GitHub, which is uh, which Microsoft also has heavy shares in. Right. Another announcement they did make on Bing, which is not there on Google, is that now your AI follows you everywhere. So now it's not just on Bing search, but also on Microsoft Edge. As you're moving through the browser, your artificial intelligence is there to make the experience better, to lead you to uh to much to sites that will help you with your research, right? And also define terms on the go, so you do not need to Google it anymore. So um, can you just um draw a picture of like how does Bing operate with their web browser? Is it like a separate um inbuilt application where you can go and ask questions, or is it? more integrated with the search. So if you go if you go into Bing there is a there is a section over there which is their AI system. You just have to click on it. It is a button. I don't think it's available over here, but it is there in the US. I see. Right? <clears throat> There's just a button there, you click on it and it opens a chat system. The coolest thing that I found about the the uh, Bing AI is the fact that it actually remembers what the last conversation was about and it moves in co- context context with that. Like ChatGPT. So the thing with ChatGPT is you have like a bunch of new chats that you can constantly keep bringing right. up, right? So that each one is a different topic. Oh, like not um, just the previous sentence to say, like yeah. whatever you said two hours ago. Yes. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And yeah, one that that's another limitation. Thank you for bringing it up okay. with ChatGPT is that you could yeah. be asking a question, but it might not be following up with the context you're in. Right. So you could ask it like, let's say, okay, fine, help me debug this code. And then you're asking and then you post just the error message. It would tell you about the error message and not how to fix it in the code. Really? That yes. Is... I have experienced it multiple times myself. So that's how I know. But Take Bing it. keeps a track record. If you were to give it uh, a, an issue, uh, a problem a problem in your programming, right? it would actually debug it for you. And then if you posted just the error message, it would say, okay, fine, it's in relation to this. Right, let's let's take it a step forward. Right. Okay, fine, we'll give you a solution. Okay, fine, this is how you have to change your codes, X, Y, Z. And this is what's going to be the output, most probably. Got it. Both Microsoft and Google have made a move to incorporate AI into their search engines, each with their own unique styles and features. Right now, Google is by far the leader in the search territory, but can we expect that to change in the next few years or even months with uh, Microsoft's new assistant? So Microsoft has been make Microsoft has been making some very smart investments, I would say. Uh, yes, it's true. Google does have a very good share in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it did develop uh, tensors, uh, t- t- TPUs, tensor processing units, which are basically one of the more powerful computers. But even in that avenue, it is being uh, challenged by NVIDIA. Uh, in terms of search, uh, Google is facing a lot of pressure. It is losing, it is losing search, uh, people searching on it day by day. Right. Uh, and I believe in the next, maybe not months or or a couple, uh, few years, but maybe seven years or eight years, it is possible for a whole new system to come in place that would overthrow Google. Because if you look at the technology space, there is so much that's happening right now to enhance the human life. Uh, with uh, Elon Musk, he's got his entire company, DeepMind, which is, which is actually a chip that's going to be implanted in your brain, which I believe will also be using artificial intelligence. We may not even need to search on Google. The answers will just come to us naturally. Wow. It seems uh, like a, a mastermind who knows all the answers. Like yeah. It's just stored in the head. Yeah. Every, you're going to have a computer in your brain. So you wouldn't need to Google anymore. Right? NVIDIA, like I said, NVIDIA has launched its own computing, which is said to be far more powerful than Google's. So the, the, the tech space is changing drastically and it's moving so fast. It's getting difficult to keep up. But it is important to keep up. These changes might be difficult to predict now because these are massive companies that have got very, very deep roots. I don't think it's going to be very easy to remind a kid to just to, to change his habits from just Google it to, okay, fine, I know the answer and explain a whole answer. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there's no, there's no knowing what's going to happen. Who knows, Microsoft might release something that's so crazy or maybe Apple might come up with their own search engine that would be even crazier than the two combined. And tech is evolving. So you never know. Things change. So OpenAI is not only known for the ChatGPT, but they also have an incredible AI image generator, DALI2. So what is DALI2 and what can it do? 
Um, so DALI 2 is another version of Chat GPT, but not for text, rather for images. The way it works is you would give it a prompt. Uh, let's say, for example, um, draw me a picture of the Day of Judgment. And it would actually draw you a picture of what it feels the Day of Judgment is, depending on different styles of uh, painters, depending on context it's given. So you could give it Quranic ayahs, for instance, and then tell it, okay, fine, depending on this now, draw the Day of Judgment, it would actually be able to paint a picture of it. So can you explain how Dali 2 is able to create these imaginative images? And are these images entirely a product of the algorithm, or do they rely on an external import? So the way the way these uh the way Dali 2's algorithm works is through another type of neural network called the CNN, which stands for Convolutional Neural Network. Right? With Dali 2, you have two processes that are happening, which is NLP. Right? We go through the whole natural language processing thing. Yeah. So that it can understand the data. Now before it decodes the data, that data is passed on through a CNN which is a much more sophisticated version of a neural network. The CNN attributes different features to different uh, numbers and decimals. Right. And it takes those features and then starts painting them in a grid. So if your image, let's say, was, for example, 500 pixel by 500 pixel, they would take a 3 pixel by 3 pixel grid or a 5 pixel by 5 pixel grid and start putting in different colors over there to paint a picture depending on what it sees. Right. So it's like um, chat GBT um, is like the interface where you tell it something and it breaks it down understands what you want it to make and then the dali part is where it actually puts the image together yeah so it looks at the features that are coming in from the from the nlp so like let's yeah. say for example day and judgment so the word day we know is attributed by light yeah judgment is going to be let's say for example wing scout because people are being judged right mm. let's say the chronic is says that there's going to be fire and you're going to be tracked by your your you know your hair or or uh so then it takes these features and these features are, for example, a person being dragged by the hair is going to be one feature. Person, hair, drag, those three different things. Simplified, they're going to be different features. They're going to be inputted into the picture. Right. There's going to be a lot of destruction or there's going to be, for example, you take the discussion of Pulistran, which is going to be so thin, it's going to be like a piece of hair. And you're going to see people walking on like a thin line over there. It would, it would take these features, it processes it, and then starts painting those features step by step like we would paint a canvas. We're taking one side to the other, in adding in our details itself. It does that on the go. And then outputs the results when it's decoding. So does it give you only one um, output or are there multiple options? Like, can you choose? So yeah, so it does give you multiple outputs and then you can pick which one you like the most. You know, there are different styles. You can have a Van Gogh sort of a style or you right. can have a cyberpunk sort of a style, so which would be more futuristic. Yeah. It depends honestly what you're looking for. Is it as good as Bing's AI generator? So... Here, here's the thing, right? You need to remember the fact that OpenAI and Microsoft are now working together. So the version of DALI 2, which is the version that we have access to, is open for the public, which is attributed with OpenAI. But Bing has got its own image generator, which people are speculating is DALI 3, which has not been released to the public yet. So are they um, together on this? Are they collaborating? Yes, 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 yes. Like, like that's why I said that they're, they've, Microsoft has invested into OpenAI, it has taken shares. Right. So it naturally has access to its technologies and they do are building a future together. So how soon can you expect Dali 3 to come out? I'm excited. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. I, I saw a, a demo video of uh, it in action and it was very impressive. It's extremely accurate. Pictures are very high quality. Right, so that's one thing I want to ask. Um, How much better is Dali 3 going to be? Because... In Delhi too, sometimes you're like, um, it has a problem with humans and text. So like, if you t told it to like, someone standing on the beach with a Hawaii written on the shirt, it's gonna mess up the text. Um, and fingers and stuff, it looks like you have like six fingers. You may, you might be missing one finger. So <laughs> that's a problem like, with Delhi too. So these these issues have naturally been reported so many times on the internet. The AI is learning from itself. The see. researchers have this, they make a list of all these issues and they start feeding it and start uh, optimizing their code so that these features are not missed out. Right? These rule sets are given to the artificial intelligence through the CNNs, which then produce better results over and over again. That's why even if you're using ChatGPT, if you're using uh, Google's Bard, if you're using uh, Bing's uh, AI, 
you will always notice that there is an option to recommend or to de-recommend the answer that's given with a thumbs up, thumbs down, or you could even tell the AI directly that no, this is not correct, it's incorrect. So will they improve the current version or will they update so the new version? So it improves the current version. And as it's improving the current version, they also improve in future versions. Right. Right? It's like you're constantly teaching your child. Uh, you take your child, for example, you tell him first time that, hey, this is hot. Second time, you're going to explain him why it's hot. Third time, you're going to tell him what the different ways, different things that could be hot. It doesn't have to be fire that's hot. Sometimes metal that's near fire can also be hot. Right. But you're teaching your child like that. And it's the same way with artificial intelligence. It's learned the first time. It's going to keep that in the first time. It's going to learn something new on the second time. If the two contradict, it's going to take the, the newer one. That, okay, fine, that this is the newer. Um, this makes more sense. I'm going to take it with this because it aligns with much more principles than I've been taught before. Right. So are there any alternative to um, DAL-E? Like this is only one image generator we've talked about. I'm sure there are many, many more. Yes, there are tons. Uh, this week, actually, there were so many that have been announced. Uh, we have... Mm. Adobe. Adobe. Adobe has released a new one called Firefly. And think Photoshop. Okay. But if artificial intelligence did everything for you. Wow. So you can just say like um, decrease the shade of this color over here. Just do it better. It would do it. it. It's not just that it would even generate patterns for you. Like let's say for example you're looking for a tiger pattern on the word yum. So it would actually throw the word yum for you in a specific wow. font. You could tell that I want uh, the word yum in a very cool and funky font. With the pattern, uh, with the tiger pattern on it, and the picture of a tiger around it, to show that there's a pack lying around there, I wow. would actually generate the whole image for you. That's amazing. The exact same way you're envisioning it with high quality images, because Adobe has got access to over millions of photos. They have people who are constantly posting to it. So there's a whole Adobe stock library, and people have contributed to this artificial intelligence to make those photorealistic pictures real. You know, right. bring those things to make it easier for for you to actually create your uh, your designs. But it doesn't end there. There is also Canva. Canva, yeah. Canva has introduced <laughs> a lot of AI into its system. Okay. So with Canva, it's not just image generation, it's also text generation. So you could ask Canva to make a whole PowerPoint for you. It would mix up text. It would mix up images. It would mix up context together to create a whole PowerPoint about cheeseburgers, for example. It's possible. Wow. Uh, those are the two key ones. Uh, we have uh, Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is doing its own generation as well with 3D models. So you would actually be able to record yourself and the your one record uh, from previously, what you would have to do is from the recording, you would have to model a whole person. You go through a whole process of rigging, which is like creating all the joints in the person. And then, then the computer will be able to to take all that and then actually start animating from there. But with their new system, you wouldn't even need to go through all that. As a matter of fact, you would actually just give it the video. It would convert it to you in a way you can animate it with the animations in place from your video. Wow, that is really advanced. I'm sure we can benefit a lot from these. There's a lot more that's happening. There's a lot more that's going on. Yeah. So um, I was watching a video on... Um, image generators and how futuristic it can get. You watch a lot of I, I do watch a lot of videos. <laughs> I've done a lot of research. <laughs> so the idea was that if an image generator like DAL-E can create any image you ask it to, you can give a prompt and make any image like over person or anything, it should be able to make multiple images of that person and then put them together, make a video, and then use another AI tool to add a voiceover or sound effects and that's a deep fake you could just like make videos of people saying things they might never have said in their life so like that would be maybe like Donald Trump giving a fake speech <laughs> <laughs> so I remember I'll, I'll tell you a story about this before I actually answer the question okay. uh, I remember I was watching uh, uh, I was doing a live stream at my university at MIT yeah. And uh, we had our class teacher who would be like, okay, fine, guys, you need to be, you know, you be ready. This, the university has actually managed to get Obama to come over there. And he's going to be talking to you from the White House. Wow. Right. And we're going to have a conversation with him. He's got some things he wants to say to you guys because you guys are learning artificial intelligence, which was very new at the time. Yeah. And I remember we were all sitting over there. We were all waiting, you know, we were all excited, <laughs> looking at the screen. Nervous. And... Uh, First, you just see like a background, the, the White House background there. 
Mm. He comes over there and he sits down and he starts speaking. He starts addressing us as the students. And, you know, he knew he knew certain things about us. He was like, oh, you know what? Uh, I remember he mentioned a name, uh, John, you know what? You're such a good football player from what I've heard from your teacher. And he goes on and he says, like, uh, so uh, and he addressed like two or three students over there. And then he was like, oh, man, he's like, okay, fine. You know, this is the president of our country. How does he know about me? Let me guess. This is fake. It, it was a deep fake. It was a deep yes, fake. it was. Because at the end, of the, the whole thing fades out and our teacher was actually there. He was the one controlling the whole thing. Wow. He was his. He was the one who was there. He was the one who had said all the words. He was the one who made the actions. And those actions were in real. They were, they were translated by the artificial intelligence into a video format in the voice of Obama. As well as his, his uh, you know, the way he moved and so on and so forth. So yeah, deep fakes, deep fakes are a thing. But they were they were for a very short time. Uh, right now, there's I think so about thirty or forty different algorithms that are there to combat against deep fakes. Google has got one. Uh, OpenAI has one, and there I believe there are five or six other individual entities who have created algorithms to ensure that deep fakes are constantly detected. So, are there any um, catches you can find in deep fakes that yes. can tell you that yes, it's a deep yes, face? definitely. First is obviously the person itself. If you know the person pers- uh, in real life, yeah. you know the things that they would say or not. It's pretty obvious to tell that, hey, you know what, this sort of a, this person is not going to say this sort of a thing. Right. But that, again, is just on a personal no, no, yeah. no, no sort of a thing. Another way to tell is you look for discrepancies within the video itself. You know, sometimes there might be like a minor glitch in the video. Uh, a, a piece might be missing, like a, a, a finger or... <laughs> Yeah, literally a piece of a finger might be missing or... Um, an extra the, finger. Yeah, an extra finger. The lips might not be moving. Uh, some Sometimes even the eyes go a bit wonky. There's these minor, minor details or the features of the person itself that you would notice are not completely 100% accurate. But the way we're moving with AI, I can imagine the next few years, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a real video and... A maybe, video. maybe. But I'm sure the big companies are working towards that right now. I don't think they can spot this. <laughs> you never know. This podcast might be a deep fake. <laughs> I'm kidding. This is true. We can see how quickly AI is developing and we can expect it to be used in every field in the next few years. So can you give us a glimpse of how AI tools will look a couple of years into the future? Like, uh, for example, look at business. Uh, would AI be able to take sales calls without any human interference? Like, if I call their business and an AI tool to just pick up and answer, like take an appointment, do all that without a human like in the back and maybe even start a whole business from single prompt as you said. Will that be possible? So we did have a couple of discussions behind the scenes. <laughs> That's how he knows that about the single prompt. <laughs> all right. Um, I think you're a bit too late with this question. Okay. Uh, back in 2016, uh, Google has got an event every year. It's called Google yeah. I.O. So back in right. 2016, they actually introduced uh, appointments with artificial intelligence. The idea was basically you would be like, hey, Google, uh, book me an appointment with uh, a salon between 7 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. Uh, tell them that I want to do my hair and um, let's say for women, they want to do their nails. And the Google Assistant would then take a step forward. They would go through the Google directory to get the number of the saloon. Right. And it would actually place the appointment with the voice, a voice call. Wow. So it would be like, hey, is it possible? Literally, they show it throughout the whole demo. And right. it's like, hey, uh, is this the name of the salon? And then the person would be like, hi, yeah, uh, this is the name of the salon. How can we help you? Like, well, I want to book an appointment for this day. Okay. Uh, the Let's say it was uh, 6th March. I want to book an appointment for 6th March uh, at 7 uh, seven a.m. Is that possible? And they'd be like, oh, no, it's not possible. We don't open at the time. We open at 8.30. And then yes. the AI would be like, okay, then can I book an appointment at 9.30? And they would be like, just give me a minute. And the AI would actually pause. Uh, I think I watched that video. And at some point, it's just like, um, give me a few minutes. You know, I'm just going to do it. And, and then Google goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yes, it was so literally crazy. like it's literally like you're talking to an actual human being. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't it was know AI or human. Yeah, being. yeah. They actually that was actually a live call. The guys over there, the son didn't even know it was an artificial intelligence. Wow. 
And that was what, like, how many years ago? Uh, six years, seven years old. So imagine how much more advanced this is going to get in a few years, even months. Yeah. So AI is moving, AI is moving faster and faster, and it's moving to make our lives a lot easier. Yeah. Right? That's one of the core things we need to remember, that artificial intelligence is not there against us, it's there to assist us, to help us, our lives become easier. And when you take that perspective, uh, over the perspective that oh my god we're gonna have Terminator coming in over here to kill us <laughs> yeah. um, it brings out a whole different spectrum of use cases for artificial intelligence okay if you think of it as an assistant rather than a competitor then you're looking at a, a future with endless possibilities right so like we stand on the shoulders of giants we just need to use it instead of try and compete against it exactly exactly and that brings about a lot of questions. You know, people come to me all the time and they're like, hey, um, artificial intelligence is growing so fast, I'm going to lose my job. That's one of our questions. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. And, uh, you know, it's just the, the only issue is people don't understand that the, the use case is for artificial intelligence. They see that this is my job, this is what I am going to do. But they don't see that, hey, okay, fine. Now, how do I use these tools that are presented to me? How do I use ChatGPT to make me a better salesperson? How do I use Adobe Firefly to improve the designs that I'm currently making? How can I take, uh, uh, for example, Bing AI and teach it and understand and take the context it's giving me and make it more emotional so that it's appealing towards human? But I think the perspective they're looking at is that AI won't need a human to pilot it. You won't need ChatGPT. You don't need to prompt ChatGPT and tell it to like write you an argument for a debate or something. What what will happen is it's just gonna do it by itself without any human um, supervision. It's just gonna do the whole process itself, and you don't. They don't need humans now. It's just outdated. Well, no, that's incorrect. Why? It's completely wrong because you see, again, you come back to the complete basics of artificial intelligence. For artificial intelligence to work, it needs data. Yeah. As long as it doesn't have data, it's not going to know what to do. And as long as it doesn't know what to do, it's just going to sit over there and do nothing. Okay. Right? It's like if you take a baby and you leave a baby in one spot, what do you expect the baby to do? You expect, it, you expect it to roam around. Yeah. But if you take a robot, you put a, ba- a robot in one spot. Yeah. Whether it's getting... Uh, whether it's... Uh, getting data or not. Do you expect it to move around or do you expect it to stay in one spot? You expect it to stay in one yeah. spot because it's not being told to do anything. It's not getting any input. It's just there. It's just existing. A baby, on the other hand, is getting input constantly. Like, oh, fine, go here. Or do this. Or do that. It's thinking for itself. So, artificial intelligence is thinking depending on the data it's receiving. It needs an input. It needs to process input so that it can give an output. And that's the reason for artificial intelligence to exist. Give me input, I will give you output. That's how the artificial intelligence thinks. Not further than that. But why can't AI go and get its own data input? Even if it does, it wouldn't know what to do with that data. Because then you come into the whole question or you come into the question of uh, how should the neural network look like? How do I build a neural network for something that does not know how to build a neural network? And okay, fine, I know how to build a neural network, but what should I build a neural network for? And even if it'd be like, okay, fine, I know how to build a neural network, I know what to build a neural network for, who is going to use me and implement it? Huh. But artificial intelligence at the end is just software. It's still contained within a box. Right. And it's only accessed by us users. As long as we don't act as the artificial intelligence, it can exist, it can continue making computations, it can keep using power and resources, but it's not going to be able to exit that box unless somebody lets it out. See, so what if somebody does that? <laughs> Terminator. <laughs> oh, now we're having Terminator. Yeah. So even if that is the case, a lot of people are worried about losing their jobs to AI. Like, um, I was watching this video, and in that they said that they, AI can take 50 MRI scans and see the results and calculate it in a, in like a few seconds while a doctor can only do like two or three a day and the cost for the AI is only like four or five cents so a lot of people are going to lose their jobs like even like taxi drivers they can lose their jobs um like farming like a lot of fields are going to be taken over by AI um so 
it's, it's a very it's a very major misconception that oh you know what AI can do so much more than me now I'm going to lose my job because I can't be as efficient or as creative or as unique as artificial intelligence. Yeah. But again, that's the way that's you looking at it at the wrong perspective. <clears throat> for example, the example you gave me for the doctors, right? Where you said the artificial intelligence could do uh, 15, 20 scans in a couple of seconds and only cost what four cents. Whereas a professional doctor would cost maybe thousands of dollars and you'd only be able to do two or three a day, yeah. right? Let's take this scenario, let's break it down, right? How, how would you be able to benefit from something like that? You see, we need to understand that as human beings, we're, our knowledge is also very limited. We can't know every single thing that's out there. A computer on the other hand knows a lot more things that are there. So even if I were to do, let's say for example, a CAT scan or a MRI, and an AI was to scan that and tell me that, hey, you have a malignant cancer in your left ha- uh, hepper, uh, the left side of your brain, your left hippocampus. I'm still, at the end of the day, I'm not a doctor. Yeah. It's the, the, the thing might be correct. The AI might be correct, but I still need to take those results back to a doctor. You need reassurance. Not necessarily for reassurance. Somebody still needs to perform the surgery. Somebody needs to give me the medications uh-huh. for it. But why can't a robot do that for you? Even if it does, you still need to go back to the doctor. If something reacts with you, yeah, it does not know that. Why not? You haven't told me. You wouldn't know. For example, for example, let's say uh, you go and you don't know you have an allergy and you go and you start taking medicine you start seeing these different symptoms happen. Okay. How would you prompt the artificial intelligence that I'm getting these symptoms? Um, Like, do you want... How would you say to a doctor? Would you tell you doctor... You go to a doctor. Them? You go to a doctor. Yeah. You would tell them, okay, fine, look, I'm taking this medicine, yeah. this medicine, this medicine. This is what I did throughout the whole day. Okay. This is what I've eaten. This is what I have done. Now tell me what's what what's happened. Let's say for example you've got a rash. So why can't you do the same thing with AI? Just go tell the robot. So you tell the robot. The robot will be like, okay, fine. Um, you might be having an uh, an allergy. You might be suffering from ten other diseases, okay. or you might be, you might be dying. Okay, so, so you can do the you, same thing as the doctor. But the doctor is gonna gonna be able to shortlist those. Do you understand? At the end of the day, it's the the thing is the AI is there to give suggestions. The AI is there as a tool to assist humanity to become yeah. a better version of itself. And if AI was taking these decisions, yeah, yeah, it's not wrong to take a second opinion from a doctor. Similarly, you get self-driving cars. Fine, they are self-driving cars, right? It would reduce. It would. It would. It might kill out a large number of people in the transportation industry. You know, people who are there with the taxi drivers. You know, your car drivers. But you also need to understand that an artificial intelligence is not going to be able to give you the luxury that a driver might be able to give you. An artificial intelligence might not be able to make the most correct decisions. Sometimes it might make wrong decisions. Because it all depends at the end of the data it's being fed. As a human, we can take data as it's coming in, process, and give an output on the go. Right. So what she's saying is that AI is there to help us become more efficient in our jobs. Exactly. Right? It's to boost our ability to do whatever job we're doing. Exactly. So, for example, on the, the example you talked about, that um, an AI tool can do 20 MRI scans in 50 MRI scans in a day. Okay. And a doctor can only do two. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 50 is equal to like 25 doctors would equal to one AI machine, right? Yeah. How many do you need to run that machine? One, two? What about the rest, like 22, 23 doctors? Where do they go? I mean, look, again, a specialist in a specific field can just pass it. it, can just pass it. If a general doctor does the scan, he yeah. can pass it to a specialist and we recommend you to a specialist and you move on with the specialist. Because a specialist has something that an AI does it, and that one thing is experience. But I would agree with that because you say the AI is being fed all this data, yeah. Over the last years, and it has more information than any doctor could gather. Yes. That's that's experience. Data and experience. No, data and experience are very different things. Okay, how? And here yeah, I might not be able to tell you why your nails are going blue, but a doctor will tell you that, okay, fine, your nails are going blue because you're lacking certain vitamins or because yeah. you're going, you're suffering through a lack of oxygen. Why would you be suffering through a lack of oxygen? A doc, uh, an AI will literally tell you you need to breathe more. <laughs> Quite literally. An AI will just tell you, okay, fine, breathe more. Or go to a specific spot and breathe more. 
A doctor okay. will tell you, no, you need to be on a respirator because your lungs are failing. I'm not saying an AI can't do that. But what I'm saying is a doctor would be able to look at you and perceive you in, in several different ways. Artificial intelligence relies on text. A doctor can rely on images. A doctor can rely on feel. A doctor can rely on, you know, looking at specific parts that even you might not be able to see. Do you think in the near future with technology advancing, those things that the doctor can do can also be like done by AI? Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. But in the end, it comes to the question on, number one, uh, how the doctor is going to utilize it to become more efficient. And number two, if they're able to monetize it or not. The entire question you should be asking yourself is, how do I take this tool and make money out of it? As opposed to, oh my God, this tool is going to kill me. Right. So that's a good point. Like AI is there to help us become better at what you do, right? But you see, look, I, I'll give you I'll give you a quick activity you guys can do right now. Pause, pause the podcast where you're at right now. Pause the podcast. You have your businesses, right? Whatever your business is doing, go to ChatGPT. Go to go to Canva. Go over there and use the artificial intelligence tools to ask it. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, write me a sales pitch for my business so that I can get an investment of a million dollars. And look at what ChatGPT responds to you. And ask yourself then that question. If I use this and I make minor adjustments here and there and I ensure that I, I put this into a PowerPoint, would I actually be able to make use of it? Just do it right now. Right now, just pause and just see how quickly it is and how easy it is to for, it's for these artificial intelligence tools to assist you. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that you guys have also experienced it. You guys must have been playing around with it yeah, all definitely. week, right? <laughs> You, you, you've seen that it's a very powerful tool. It's a tool that can take you from being 50% effective to 250, up to 300% more effective. Right. Yeah. Closing deals, uh, building presentations, uh, self-help, uh, understanding different uh, concepts that are uh, available today, whether it's in physics, chemistry, biology, and simplifying it to, to a level where even a fifth grader or sixth grader would be able to understand. That's the use case for artificial intelligence today. Right. We can see how rapidly AI is advancing and we can imagine that in a few years, AI is going to be used in a lot of different fields and it's going to help us become much more efficient. But um, I'm sure some people um, would like to know how we can prepare for this age of AI, AI by how can we move into this era without going through any risks and maximizing benefits. So... I'm pretty sure everybody knows um, high risk, high reward, low risk, low reward. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, as AI is advancing, as AI is becoming smarter, as AI is uh, becoming a better tool, right? We need, to, we need to understand how to use this tool. If you go look back in history, man first started with just fists yeah. and feet. We would move around. We would do hunting ourselves, right? Uh, fast forward a couple of years, we got the first tools, the spear, spears, uh, we used rocks uh, to make a fire, so on and so forth. But fast forward that again, you come to an age where now everything's starting to get more automated. We've got food farms in place. We Our vegetation is being uh, grown with fertilizers, so on and so forth. Yeah, and just like that, this is another step towards becoming a more automated and efficient society, right? How we can prepare for this? Well, it's understanding the use cases of AI before it takes over. Even if AI were to take over every single job, there still needs to be people over there in place to assist. There needs to be people over there in place to direct the AI in, in its course. Yeah, but The AI is not going to be able to make decisions unless it has information. Otherwise, yeah. they're just decisions and not informed decisions. Right. A couple of years ago, there was a very large hype for prediction analysis, where basically you would give data to the AI and it would make predictions for you. People used it for sale forecasting. People used it for predicting stock markets. People predicted uh, even the emotions of people, other people, depending on what it said to them. Now, well, okay, fine, you'll be like, hey, now artificial intelligence is even understanding emotion and it's being able to predict the market. We're not safe anymore because now I'm a financial analysis, uh, ana uh, analyst. And artificial intelligence is doing exactly my job. What's left for me to do? Exactly. That's my question. Here's the thing. Our artificial intelligence takes the data it's given in. 
you'd give it a list of numbers. It'd give you an output of a list of numbers. Yeah. As an analyst, it's your duty to understand these numbers from the artificial intelligence and now start writing reports on, hey, okay, fine. Because the, this is like this, this is going to be the cause and effect of it. The artificial, the artificial intelligence might not know what's causing these numbers to go up or down. But as a financial analyst, analyst, you have that advantage over the AI because you're perceiving data on the go. And similarly, when you go look at uh, predictions, you go look at uh, emotions. These are things that the artificial intelligence has a, a base for. It's not 100% concrete. But as humans, we understand this better because we experience it every single second. The words you say to a person, you're understanding the face, the way his facial is moving, whether he's becoming a bit more angry, is he becoming calmer, is he getting uh, agitated, is he uh, about to cry. You know, it depends honestly. And those things are not things that artificial intelligence has reached a level to uh, comprehending. Uh, rather, it's more like, okay, fine, you know, if you notice these few key factors, then you can keep an eye out. So the future seems bright. It does. It's just opportunity. It's just opportunity. It's yeah. how you take the opportunity, how you grab onto it, and how you make it your own. Right. Well, that's it for today. Um, thank you for answering our questions. Uh, we really benefited from it. And I'm sure you guys have learned something new from this episode too. So next time you talk tech with your friends, you can impress them with the newfound knowledge of AI. Uh, by the way, and I'm sure some of you guys have guessed already, we use ChatGPT to help us with the script. So half of everything we say was produced by ChatGPT. Come on, that's not cheating. I mean, it's a science podcast <laughs> after all. <laughs> so thank you guys for watching this episode and stay tuned for the next ones. With that, we'll say goodbye, but not for long. See you in the next episode.